This is a big topic, which is not very controversial in general. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about entrepreneurship because it's a very important concept in economics. And uh, it helps us understand better how market works and um, what is their role. When you study economics, you, most people, when they think about entrepreneurs, they tend to confuse entrepreneurs with managers. When people think entrepreneurs, they think Steve Jobs, um, Peter Thiel, all those people that have been uh, held as heroes of a market right now. Um, when you compare business fields and economics, we have a different view of what an entrepreneur is. Right? And even among economists, we tend to make a huge distinction between Schumpeter and Mises and Kirzner. The distinction is slightly subtle, but it's important. Right. Schumpeter uh, was a historian of economic thought. He also believed that capitalism was uh, bound to collapse as a result of wave of concentration of businesses. And as a result of that, socialism will take over. It's a very simplified, shortened version of the story. But Schumpeter was also very much in love with Léon Valras, because he thought that Léon Valras discovered one of the greatest concepts in economics, which is the idea of general equilibrium. Right? And when you have a general equilibrium, it means all the markets are connected to each other, are all in equilibrium. You have no surpluses, and you have no shortages. If you think about general equilibrium, particularly in the perfectly competitive model, there's no such thing as a profit. In the long run, profits are equal to zero. As you make profit in the short run, you are going to attract a bunch of businesses that are going to try to capture some of the profit. Yes? But it's economic profit, not economic profit. Economic profit, that's correct. Which means you take into account opportunity cost. So when you make profits, you're going to attract a bunch of uh, businesses that are going to want their share of the pie to make profit as well. Supply, is going to, uh, supply of businesses is going to increase. Prices are going to increase. Your cost of production are going to increase. So you have a movement where the price at which you're going to sell the goods are going to decrease, and the cost of production are going to increase, where to the point the price is equal to average total cost, and your long-run profits are equal to zero. Right. So when you reach general equilibrium, and profits are zero, there's no room for the entrepreneur. Right. So for Schumpeter, the solution to that is to bring the idea of creative destruction. Schumpeter is an innovator that is going to disturb the equilibrium. Is an external force to the market that discover a new idea, a new process of production, a new good, a new service, comes in the market and just push the generic rhythm away and disturb it. Right? That's what Schumpeter entrepreneur, Entrepreneurs is. That's what we call about creative destruction. You destroy the previous state of affairs by bringing something new that is going to distract the consumers, that is going to change the consumer preferences. Here's come Mises and Kirzner. I call that Mises Kirzner theory of entrepreneurship because they are jointly connected. Right? Kirzner was a Mises student at NYU, and his main contribution of Kirzner is to have extended uh, the uh, Mises theory of entrepreneur. According to Mises, the entrepreneur and Kirzner, the entrepreneur is not a disequilibrating force, it's an equilibrating force. When in a state of disequilibrium, where resources are misallocated, in the sense that some resources could be used to be more productive, 
more useful to produce goods that consumer va will value more, right? So therefore, for Mises and Kirzner, the entrepreneur is a speculator. Right? His virtue, or his quality of special skill, is what Mises called judgment, and Kirzner talk about alertness. What are you alert to? You are alert to profit opportunities. Right? So what is a profit opportunity? Is when, and that's kind of difficult to understand, because, well, maybe the French accent makes it more difficult. In a perfectly competitive world, there is no such thing as uncertainty. There is no such thing as imperfect information. That's why prices, when you think from a methodological viewpoint, right, prices and cost of productions are equal. Right? The prices of a good at which you sell your good are equal to the sum of the cost of production, and that's why you don't have any profits. If you live in a world of uncertainty, right, resources are not necessarily allocated to their most valuable use. Therefore, sometimes, some of the factors of production could be allocated to more valuable use. Which means those factors of production are undervalued by the market. Which means the entrepreneur is alert to that profit opportunity by saying, hey, I could use those factors of production, reallocate them to produce that type of good that consumers will value. Because production takes place in time. You don't produce good to satisfy consumers' needs right now, desires right now. You produce good to satisfy consumer desires in the future. Right? So when you take into account this idea is that the entrepreneur is going to take some resources, reallocate them to produce a good that they think consumers are going to value. The profits come from the fact that you are going to sell a good at a high price or at a price higher than it costs you to make that good. If you are making a loss, you made a mistake in your assessment of what consumers will desire in the future. Which means you bought some factors of production and you try to sell a good at a higher price, but don't, consumers don't value that good or that service. Therefore, the cost you pay for those factors of production is far higher or higher than the, the good you are producing in terms of value. What makes the entrepreneur successful is his skills and ability to judge the consumer preferences in the future. Steve Jobs, for many years, was considered as a failure. Why? Was he considered, why was he considered a failure for many years? Well, you're a little bit young. Maybe you don't know about things. But in the 80s and 90s, Right, probably in the 90s, Apple was almost bankrupt to the point that Microsoft invested in Apple to keep it alive. Consumers didn't want to buy Apple products until came the, the magical iPhone, right? And what was the vision of Steve Jobs? He used factors of production that everybody was using to produce other type of phones, or computers, or tablets, and we allocate them and made that magical, simple tool, which is a phone and a computer at the same time, you can do everything with that thing, except cooking and cleaning my apartment, but maybe one day, right? Maybe you push a button and a maid will come immediately. Right? But you can call a car service on your phone. It's the application that brings you a car service if you want to, right? So, if you have a disequilibrium, it means that some factors of production are not allocated to their most valued uses. Which means when you have a disequilibrium, is that the supply is either greater than the demand, or the demand is greater than the supply. You have a shortage or a surplus. Right. When you have a shortage, what's happening to prices in general? They go up, right? Therefore, prices send a signal that 
that good is in demand, and surplus sends a signal that that good is no longer in demand. All right. The entrepreneur, as an arbitrager in space, will reallocate resources from one market to another market to see these opportunities. In time, it's the same issue. You are going to use some factors of production to produce a good that people don't want, apparently in the present, but they might want in the future. That's why you have Schumpeter, entrepreneur, that's reconciled with Kirzner theory. Now, it's important that we understand that the price mechanism, the signal that the price is most sent, must be clear and accurate. Right? In the sense, it must be not distorted by forces outside imperfections such as uncertainty, such as government regulations or government manipulation of a monetary system. Right? Entrepreneurs make mistakes. Sometimes they make mistakes because they misjudge what consumers will want. But they also sometimes make mistakes because the signal that the prices are sending to them is distorted. So I don't want to steal the John Cochran talk on business cycle, which is tomorrow, I guess, right? Which is basically inflation does what? It distorts prices, right? And therefore, if prices go up, people are going to say, hey, prices go up. It must mean consumers want that good. So I'm going to produce that good and reallocate my resources. Right? When people realize that those projects are never going to fulfill because that signal that inflation was sending was actually a, not a good signal, was a, a fake signal, people are going to take away the resources when everything goes down to the tube, collapse. All right? Profits, therefore, according to Mises and Kirzner, are a reward to succeed, for succeeding in allocating resources to their most valuable uses. Now, the question that Kirzner is asking is, do we ever reach equilibrium? No. Why don't we ever reach equilibrium? Because people's preferences, consumer desires, are changing all the time. And therefore, you need entrepreneurs to constantly, purposefully trying to find profit opportunities to operate in the market. Right? That's why the entrepreneur is considered as a driving force of the market. Right? The idea of the entrepreneur hero in Mises and Schumpeter is this idea that the entrepreneur is zero because he's going to steer the market in one direction or another to, with one single purpose, which is to do what? Satisfy consumers. I disagree with that answer. Make profit. Make profit. And to make profit, you need to satisfy the consumers. Right. So you are not incorrect. But the ultimate goal of the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur is not... An angel. He's not the devil, devil either. He's not, but he's not an angel which is altruistic. Right? Think about Adam Smith. Right? The products of the butcher and the baker. They are not, it's not at the goodness of their heart that they are trying to sell good bread and good meat at the lowest possible price. It's because to satisfy... The only way for them to make money and satisfy their own private interests or self-interest is to satisfy the interests of the other people, right? And the entrepreneurs do the same thing, right? If you prefer this equilibrium tendency, this reallocation of factors of production to more valuable use, the only goal of the entrepreneur is to make profits. Right? That benefit to the consumers is only a byproduct. But if you cannot make profits, what's happening as an entrepreneur? You are failing, yes. But assume, for example, you have been taxed 15% of your profit, like it is in the US right now, I think, 15. Then you have less incentive to make more profit. Yes, you have less incentive to try to reallocate those resources 
to use your alertness or your judgment or your innovative skills to try to satisfy the consumers who make those profits. Right? Now, there's another I never talk, I didn't talk on that slide, which is Frank Knight. Frank Knight wrote his PhD dissertation in 1921. He's uh, one of the founders of the University of Chicago. Frank Knight had also a theory related to Moses and Kirchner and Schumpeter about the entrepreneur. Right? Profit for Sh Frank Knight is a reward for bearing uncertainty. The difference between uncertainty and risk, according to Frank Knight, is that risk can be calculated. Because risk, you can assign a probability to risk. And when you assign a probability, it means you can calculate your chances of success or failure. Right? But to be able to assign a probability, you need to be able to do what? To have what? Repeated events. Right? Frequential probability is based on, on repeated events. But when it comes to economic decisions or business decisions, are the events when they repeat exactly the same? No. Because once you make a decision, a business decision, you are going to change the entire economic environment around you. Therefore, the decision to repeat that decision again, that choice to make the decision again, is irrelevant because you are facing uncertainty because this event is not exactly the same. You don't have the same control condition than when you have a lottery. So for Frank Knight, profit is a reward for bearing uncertainty, which cannot be calculated and difficult to, uh, uh, it's not a real English term, probabilize, make probability on. Right? Now, do you have any questions before I move on the firm? Yes. This is interesting. Today you were talking about how what really motivates entrepreneurs is profit. Um, but yesterday you were talking about the students you have that say they want to go major in this or that field so they can make a lot of money. Yes. And you said that that's not a smart move because you'll only make money doing something you really like. Uh, it feels like in, in my life when I meet entrepreneurs, as a general rule, I mean, there are so, some certainly that are just in it to make money. But I find it more frequent that they're really into it because they really want to start a company doing this or that because it's just sort of their passion and the profit. Obviously, they have to make a profit to survive. But the real guiding light is just you know, an interest in owning an auto shop. It's just something they've always wanted to do. And the profit is somewhat secondary. I shouldn't say more. I, what do you want to tell you? If, if I'm right or wrong? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I would argue that wanting to do something that you like is part of a condition of a success, but the idea, uh, usually what strive people is the, an opportunity, right? For example, think about Mark, uh, Zuckerberg, right? How did Zuckerberg become that billionaire guy? Facebook, uh, and what sparked Facebook profit, or Facebook idea on Max Newcomer without going on the full details of a movie or a book? The, he, saw an he saw an opportunity that people like to have connection with other people, not necessarily on face to face, the people that are far away from each other, right? But he saw an opportunity. What was his original passion? Computers. All the thing he was doing was playing on computers, doing internet thing, and he was good at it, right? So he was operating in the market, right? I agree with that. He was operating in market. He liked, he was successful at what he was. But what sparked his choice to create Facebook, or at least partly, was he saw profit opportunity. He saw there was something not happening in the market, but the market was missing. And he saw the opportunity to expand from what are college Facebook to the real Facebook, which is beyond college or beyond university campuses by being himself, which means that my understanding of Kirchner and Mises is not people want to make profits, but 
People operate in the market being alert. So which means you are not outside the market. You're already operating in the market doing what you lack. And suddenly you see a profit opportunity, you're going to seize it. Right? If you see a bank note, $100 on the floor, will you take it? Yeah. Right? Do you have an opportunity you're going to take it, all right? Even if it distracts you for five minutes of whatever you're doing that you will enjoy doing, and you're going to grab it. In that case, Kirchner is telling us the entrepreneur is doing something in the market that he might be liking, but suddenly he sees by operating the market a profit opportunity is going to seize it. And he's going to redirect the market. And you can say the passion of the entrepreneur is actually to find new ways to satisfy consumers to make money. Right? They are not inconsistent, uh, in my humble opinion, therefore, they are not inconsistent with each other. Now, when I say about the students, I still stand. I mean, you st to be successful, you have to be doing something you love. All right? If you want success, you in general, one of the conditions is to be success is to do something that you love. Mm -hmm. Rarely do you see people that are successful and they hate what they are doing. Or rarely you, there's a lot of, I mean, I don't want to stray away to the discussion, but when it comes, whether we talk about money or profits, people passion is only the driving force behind these profit opportunities. Passion for what they are doing. They want to improve things, the state of affairs, right? And often it's by introspection, right? I mean, Mises talk about that in a book called Theory and History. He talks a lot about introspection. And Adam Smith talk about the sympathy principle. How do you know what consumers will like? Well, you are a human being yourself. As a human being, you have this ability to try through introspection to think about what you think is missing in your life. And once you find what is missing in your life, you are going to try to see if by seizing that profit opportunity to apply it in a bigger scale. More questions? A, yes, go ahead. Just a comment is the way I see this kind of confusion between whether they do what they love versus like purely making a profit, this is kind of a uh, mix between it. Like I don't think people do things just because they purely love it. They like let's say they love zookeeping. They they don't want to just do zookeeping. They want to make a living doing zookeeping. So the profit incentive is there, but what they're doing is they're working in the framework of what they love. Like if they had three interests and they all loved, they loved all of them, they would do the thing that was most profitable. I don't know, can you live off love and fresh water? I can't, but I'm very greedy, so I love money. I um, so the entrepreneur, as I said, is the driving force of a market. Now, the next step is to discuss the firm. So the firm is a concept that for many years was uh, Ronald Coase talked about the black box of economic theory. Well, if you take any economic class, of, you know, you have this theory of a firm where, hey, you have those cost of productions, those curves, and you have a demand curve, a marginal revenue curve, and let's find out the point at which you are going to maximize your profit, which where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Bing. That, that's that easy. All right? Woohoo! And cause is like, well, wait a minute. There are two ways you can produce goods. Right? You can make or you can buy. Right? It's the idea of market versus the firm. Right? You can produce goods by buying a bunch of goods separately and assembling them. Or you can make those parts of a good and, and assembling them yourself. Right? So you can either buy parts of a car and go to your plant and assemble the parts. That's one way of producing. 
or you can make the parts of a car and assemble the car yourself. Right? So the decision that Coase is talking about, when do firms emerge, is when do we decide to use the market? And when do we decide to make our own stuff in production? Right? The key concept in Ronald Coase is transaction cost. So what are transaction costs? The concept of transaction cost is the idea that every time you engage in an exchange with somebody, you are going to have to find a person that wants to do the exchange with you. You are going to have to agree on the terms of a contract. And you are going to have to decide for prices, how long the terms of a contract are going to be, etc., etc. The cost of transacting beyond the price of buying stuff. Sometimes Coase says, when you are buying something repeatedly, the transaction costs are far greater to use the market than if you make your stuff yourself. Therefore, Coase's crucial model or theory of a firm is that a firm will emerge, will, you will decide to make your own goods, right? to make, as opposed to buy, when the transaction costs of using the market are greater than the cost, transaction costs of making your own products. Right? If the costs of making your own products are greater, right, you do have transaction costs in the firm when you have all those job contracts within the firm. You have to agree with your employees the terms of a contract. You have to have ne renegotiation contract costs, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So when the co transaction costs of making your goods or services are greater than the transaction costs of using the market, you are going to use the market. When the transaction costs of using the market are greater than the transaction costs in the firm, you are going to make your own stuff. Right? Now, here comes the idea of limits of a firm. Right? What is, what defines a firm size? What? What are, can you imagine a firm which is like a, um, in French we had this TV show called, um, that used to make fun of uh, Stallone, and Stallone was the CEO of World Corp, a big corporation that owns the entire world. Right? Because for French, Sylvester Stallone is like the typical American. You know, because of Rocky, you know, Adrian, all this it's like the man, right? So if you imagine a big CEO, you think about Stallone, CEO of the World Cup, right? And that corporation owns the entire world and controls the entire world. Could you have one big corporation controlling the entire world? Or one big corporation controlling the entire United States? What will it be unlikely? Yes? Once it gets past a certain size, it'd be unwieldy and impossible to manage. And yes. Your transaction costs within the firm will be far higher than using the market. Because the more people you have working for you, right, the higher are your costs of monitoring people. And the higher are your costs of monitoring people, the more difficult it is to make them make decisions efficiently. Right? So when you take an uh, economic class, we talk about the idea of principal agent problem. The agent is the employee. The principal is the employer. If the employer cannot monitor perfectly his employee, what is the employee going to do? He's going to make decisions to maximize his own self-interest but often at the expense of the interest of his employer. Typical example. Do you ever get free drinks in a bar? If you drink alcohol, I, I'm not saying I'm drinking alcohol is a good thing, I'm asking you. If you go to a bar, do you ever get free drinks? Yeah. What, what, why, why usually bartenders are willing you to give you free drinks? Or shots? 
What, what's, the, what's the argument? Because of the goodness of his heart? Or her heart? But if he give you a free drink? If he give you two free drinks? Well, he never give you a free drink when you start. He usually give you free drinks after a few drinks. He wants a tip. Right? He wants a higher tip. The more free drinks you get, the higher you're going to reward the bartender. But the tip doesn't come back in the pocket of whom? Of the bar owner. Right? As a result, that's why bar owners have difficulties, have policies you cannot give away free drinks because that comes out of the pocket of a bar owner, which is a principle. But the agent is going to do what? I can get a bunch of tips by just giving away free drinks. Right? That's why usually, by the way, as a rule, and I know because I, I have many friends in the service industry, they never give away free drinks for liquor. Most of the free drinks are beers. Because it's much more difficult to control the quantities of beer you sell every day out of a keg than it is to control the quantity of liquor you give away out of a bottle. The keg is difficult to know when the keg is empty because you have thousand customers and how many of them were paid. But for the liquor, every night the bar is supposed to measure how much liquor is left in the bottle and they can uh, relate the charge of liquor to how much liquor is left in the bottle. It's much easier to control liquor giveaway than it is to control beer giveaway. Right? But the basic idea is that if your firm is too big, the monitoring costs are too high. And if the monitoring costs are too high, you are going to have what we call mismanagement of a company, of a firm, and as a result, you are going to have loss of efficiency. Right? The solution to that came from Harold Demsetz and Armin Alchem, both were professor at UCLA. I will talk about the uh, Alchem Demsetz theory of a firm. They follow on the steps of Ronald Coase, and they tell us the thing. Production in a firm is usually team production. When you produce in a firm, you talk about team production. And team production is usually producing more than individual's production. Right? What it tells us, though, is that because you have team production, it is much more difficult to assess the marginal productivity of each worker. Therefore, some workers will have incentive to shirk, which means to slack around in team production. So what is the solution that our old them sets and Alchon offer? They say we should just hire a monitor, somebody who is going to be hired to monitor the team production. And that person who is going to be hired to monitor the team production will get what we call residual, we call it the residual claimant, which means part of the profit will go to that monitor that will specifically dedicate his time to ensure that every member of the team produced to their marginal productivity. It's a very important thing, right? Which relates to my topic of yesterday, which is property rights, right? You have a reallocation of property rights within the firm to the monitor with charges to ensure that the mismanagement is minimized. Right. I want to relate that, and I don't want to still have a talk for tomorrow or later, on the socialist calculation debate and national economics. The socialist calculation debate was a debate about whether a socialist economy could be as efficient or more efficient than a capitalist economy. A socialist economy is was defined as this economic system where you have public ownership of a means of production, which means the factors of production are owned, 
in common Bible society or its representative, the agent, the government. Basically, the government decides where to allocate the factors of production. The question that Mises and I like, were trying to answer when they were debating those socialist economies, which, by the way, were Americans, and teaching at prestigious American universities like MIT and Princeton, right? which is bizarre, right? Given that America is supposedly the bastion of capitalism. And what Mises and Hayek try to say, it's impossible for a socialist economy to be as efficient as a capitalist economy because in a socialist economy, you don't have a price system, you don't have any exchanges of factors of production, and because you don't have any exchange of factors of production, you don't have people that buy factors of production and reallocate them to competitive lines of production, you don't have a price system. And therefore, without a price system, you don't have any ability to calculate profit and loss. And if you cannot calculate profit and loss, you don't know where to allocate your factors of production. Which leads me to the size of a firm. As a firm grows, expand, you are reducing the size of the markets. You are taking away markets. As a firm starts buying the, produce, the providers and the suppliers, you know, the, when a firm integrates vertically, they buy their providers, their suppliers, and they also buy their resellers. When you integrate your firm, you are shrinking the market. You are eliminating markets by default. And as you eliminate markets, you eliminate prices. And as you eliminate prices, it makes it much more difficult for you to calculate profit and loss. That's why you cannot have one big world size firm. That's why you cannot have a big one corporate America. Because as you eliminate those markets, you cannot calculate profit and loss. Data to evidence my point. In the 80s, the 1980s, we are characterized by waves of mergers, industrial concentration, where you had vertical and horizontal concentrations. What? The 90s were characterized by the opposite move, where you have waves of disintegration. Firm signs to split. What does that tell us? It's two things. First, as firms become bigger and bigger, you have bigger and bigger agency problems or principal and agent problems, more mismanagement, right? more difficulties to control and monitor your workers. That's the point number one, which is related to Alchon and Demsets. But the second point is that as firms become bigger and bigger, the price system was shrinking. It was much more difficult to calculate your profit and loss. It was much more difficult to know what you produce and how many quantities. I think I'm done. I am done. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Sir? Um, I'm just a little confused about when you're saying the impossibility of it, because that's a, that's a pretty strong statement. And all of your arguments are just saying that it's really hard to do these things. Well, there's an argument, as Mises say, it was impossible, not even in one second, because in the ideal world of socialists, you have one world socialism world, right? So one world government owns all the factors of production. And therefore, there is not ability one, for even one second to calculate profit and loss. So you are led to produce things you don't know what produce. But where, but where, do, you, where do you draw the distinction from like a small group of people on an island to a world? Like there, is, there doesn't seem to be a clear line where you cross it, where it's like, here it's possible, but then if we cross here in this size, it's impossible. Well, so that's where the theory of a firm, of the limits of a firm comes around, right? When you have less and less markets, which has been eliminated because of concentration, the price system becomes more and more eliminated, and you have no longer a principal loss. I don't have 
with no, to my knowledge, with no evidence that Celsius vast should be as big a firm should be. Right? You have the concept of efficient scale in economics of a firm, but that's different. It's about your average cost of production. Right? But you have, to calculate your average cost of production, you need a price system. You need some prices to be able to calculate your cost and your revenues and all those things to be able to carry profit and loss. Um, so Mises and Hayek and Coase and, and, and Chamberlain, I think my, if my memory serves me well, called firms island of consciousness, which means island of actual centralized organization, right, where somebody can centralize, compared to market where it's decentralized. What's what Hayek called cosmos and taxes. Cosmos as spontaneous orders, decentralized the market, and taxes are concentrated uh, organization orders where you have planifications. Right? But so the, when you look at the empirical studies, here I'm referring to empirical studies, uh, statistical analysis studies, but I look at those, those two ways, the 80s versus the 90s. But the argument is, as firms grow bigger, they serve, the management science people say they suffer more and more agency problems, more and more mismanagement, where the CEOs have big desires to build an empire. Because the bigger is your corporation, the bigger your perks are. You can get your chauffeur, you can get a sauna in your office, you can get uh, your own free apartment, all those things, right? So you are going to try to build an empire. But when you build an empire, it's very difficult to monitor what everybody's doing in your empire. That's why the 90s, firms, shareholders stop looking at their CEOs and their board of directors and say, look, this must stop. Right? You must, we need to start splitting because we become inefficient. Yes, sir. It seems like, given the really heavy amounts of distortion on the market, and that so many of those distortions are products of rent seeking, that it seems likely to me, at least, that most of the much larger uh, firms are operating at much higher capacity than they would be in like a free market. Does that seem accurate? Yes. Well, I will talk about. Um, crony capitalism. Yes. Later this, is it this afternoon, right? Or is is out. <laughs> I think it's my last talk in the afternoon, isn't it? Uh, I will talk about crony capitalism. That's an idea where you have firms which are far bigger than they should be, and they are, and, and the idea of too big to fail is because we allow those people to grow beyond efficient measure because they were protected by political forces. Unions and politicians. Yes. yes, sir. How did you define the firm? It's a nexus of contracts. But some people define the firm as a set of property rights. So it depends which economist. Huh? So there is no uniform theory of a firm. There are actually theories of a firm. Right? The most conventional one used is Ronald Coase, which is the one I like to talk about. But uh, you have very different models. Uh, I think I like to talk about cost because he got the Nobel Prize for that, most likely. Right? His idea of transaction costs and other firm work. Corel Coase is one of the least productive economists in the history of time. <laughs> he wrote like three big papers, and that's it. And he got the Nobel Prize in economics. Least productive. <laughs> he was the most efficient, less productive economist. He's, how, many, how many Nobel Prize do you know became Nobel Prize with only three papers in their pocket? None. But every paper wrote was right on point. Right? He wrote the theory of a firm, the nature of a firm, the problem of social cost, and he has a big paper on the FCC. 
Both have the three big papers. He wrote a bunch of papers, both say, but not three major papers with those three ones. So he was the most efficient economist, yes. He maximized his bank for his buck. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the 80s and 90s were characterized by a huge change in laws, where the 80s, probably in the 80s, you had the increase in junk bonds uh, and takeovers markets, and the Wall Street was big, all this insider trading thing going on. But also, they were characterized by corporate laws that strongly favor management against shareholders. That allow management to protect, to entrench themselves in the corporation. And once you entrench, you have more opportunities to abuse the power you have and to make decisions to serve your own interest at the expense of your real employers, which are the shareholders. When you mean decentralization, like more like uh, the Reagan era, when you had more privatization of these things, more competition, more deregulation, that's correct. Right. Like before the deregulation of the airline industry, there's only a few airlines operating in the US. So you had a huge number of airlines. But I'm talking about all the type of concentration, like all the type of corporations buying branches. So I'm not. You're correct that the deregulation of the airline industry in the 80s led to increasing competition and the birth or emergence of many small airlines. Which, by the way, now, as you can see, airlines are concentrating a lot, merging a lot, a lot, a lot, to facilitate and they take advantage of bankruptcy laws to be able to reorganize their capital and their assets to be able to survive. Did I answer your question? Okay, that's what matters. Hopefully, right way. But yes, sir. Uh, I guess I'm more curious personally, like the how you kind of came to become like a market anarchist in France, and what it's like to be a market <laughs> anarchist in a place like France. <laughs> it's difficult. What do you think I moved to the U.S.? <laughs> uh, the the the. I was lucky enough, it's a, long, it's a long story, but I'm going to make it short. When I was a, uh, a senior in high school, my history professor, well, all my professors were big lefties, right? Left, left oriented. They call themselves socialists. They were for the Socialist Party in France. And, and uh, an economist from the university I went later wrote a small book <laughs> called The Green Plague. That was a strong criticism of the environmentalist movement. All right? But they didn't understand the environment, they didn't understand the benefits of property rights, and all those left-oriented environmentalist movements were completely far wrong. That gentleman, his name was Gérard Bramoulet. And he happened to be, to be my professor of history economic thought in my freshman year at university. And after he became my professor of money and banking in my sophomore year. And after he became my professor of economic growth and fluctuation in my in junior year. And after he became my professor, I forgot what was my uh, senior year class. But he became my doctoral thesis advisor. It just happened that most economists and professors who I went to were actually free market economists. All of them. How did that come about is that in the 70s, there was only one university in the city, a town I went to college to, which was mostly composed of economists who were left, neo Marxists, Canadians, Keynes. Keynes. And in the 70s, a group of economists went to the University of Chicago 
and discover Chicago Economist, Freeman, and also discover public choice. They came back to their university and wanted to talk with their colleagues, and their colleagues didn't want to hear anything about that. What did they do? They seceded and created their own university. And I went to that university. I could have turned a left if I had been to the wrong one, right? <laughs> So to some extent, it was bad luck. I was never very political in high school. I didn't really care about uh, politics and things. But um, you know, um, I became a market anarchist after years of studies. As I will talk about later this afternoon, the big question I'm always asking myself is what can the government do that the market cannot do, that markets cannot do? Right. It's a very short story. Yes, sir. I've seen. Oh, oh okay, good. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> um, one of the things that I always run into with the socialist population debate, especially okay, when right. you're talking to a, a leftist, a lot of times what I get, especially from more intellectual people on the left, is that they'll agree with you and say, oh, you know, yeah, of course you, the socialist population debate. You know, we all know how that ended up. We know socialism doesn't work. We believe in markets too. It's just that we believe that you need X, Y, and Z regulations, and we'll go into this long list. So. Can that socialist calculation principle be applied to modern Keynesians and leftists? Is there something in that debate that is useful for that purpose? Or should we yes. So, to, uh, so uh, I don't want to sell my colleagues' entire lecture, but I'm going to make it short. Hayek wrote a paper in 1945 called The Usual Knowledge in Society. That's one of the most powerful papers you can read. And it's also one of the most difficult papers you can read. I read it like 10 times, and there's still things I couldn't discover. It's a very subtle debate. But that paper is very subtle because the, the basic idea is that prices send a signal which is much more complex than you think it is. And the origin of prices is much more complex than it is. There's much more things incorporated in the prices than the same signal that the price are high, it means resources are scarce, or price are low, means you have abundance of resources. It's much more complex than that. But I don't want to st still I even lecture. So I assume you are going to talk about that, right? So I'm not saying anything. All my colleagues still stuff from me, but I don't want to steal any. I don't want to steal any thunder. <laughs> yes, sorry, you were going to ask a question. Did I answer your question partially? Okay. So I recommend you to read, but the lecture will help you. Yeah, um, I've seen some people make arguments for worker self-management on the basis of the principal agent problem, mm -hmm. and then also that they're more likely to have a passive knowledge of the, the job they're actually doing. Is yeah. How far would you say that those arguments go? Okay, my knowledge of a type of literature is very weak. Uh, I recommend you to read David Pritchitko, has done a lot of research on that topic, and I think he wrote a book on that thing, and this idea of you know, worker self-management and that thing. Oh, so I will have that gentleman and after that gentleman. Go ahead. Uh, at least in the United States, there's, there's certainly been like somewhat of a political alliance between libertarian-minded people and often like paleocons, such as like Pat Buchanan. I was wondering if there's anything like that in France, particularly with like the Le Pen family. <laughs> um, two things. Uh, politics bores me to death. I'm a very pessim as I will see, I'm a very pessimistic person when it comes to politics. Uh, we have a, an expression in France. We say. C'est blanc bonnet, c'est bonnet blanc, which means they are interchangeable. They have two faces of the same coin. I, I, they are similar uh, alliances, but uh, I think if you want to ask me my, opi my personal opinion, which should not be video recorded right now, <laughs> please don't send it to the NSA. I'm in trouble. I'm applying for citizenship right now. <laughs> uh, those are bad alliances, bad strategies. They're, and they will come back later to hit you very hard. And I'm thinking about Ron Paul and some scandalous letters, newsletters. But I don't want to go deep in that discussion no more. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen? Uh, Sir? I agree with everything that you said, but I think there's a portion of economics and business that isn't economic at all 
Um, for example, a lot of business is relational. So it might not be about prices or, or anything economic. It might be that you know, me and the purchasing agent enjoy playing golf together, and that's, yes. you know, that's why we do business. Reputation mechanism, yes, relational. Yeah. But the way you do business, it's an hidden price. It's, it's, a, it's not a real price, but the, let the guy win at golf or yeah. pay for golf. I mean, there's a lot of literature on how to resolve those agency problems. Like, for example, David Krabs talks about corporate culture. The idea of corporate culture is to develop rules. So think about institutions, rules of behavior within the corporations where expectations of things are to be done are common knowledge for everybody. There's a joke running at Nordstrom, which was Nordstrom when they started their own corporate culture is that whatever you return to customer services, you have to take it. Whatever thing somebody comes to Nordstrom say, I want to return that thing, I have to take it, including a tire. So if somebody comes with a car tire and drop it on your counter and say, I want to return that, people at Nordstrom have to take it back. That was a joke, obviously, but that, that's, that's the joke I was running at Nordstrom for a long time. So yes, you, you, prices is not the only mechanism and contracts are not the only mechanism, right? Because contracts within the firms are what we call incomplete. You can't write everything in the contract about every possible thing that can happen within the firm. That's why we have what we call the residual claimant, which is only the property owner that makes the ultimate decision of what you should do when something which is not listed in the contract happens. Right? When you have corporate culture, is what you should do, broad rules of behavior when something happens within your business. Yeah, I don't, I'm an economist, but I do believe that uh, uh, Hayek used to say, an economist with only an economist is a bad economist. To be a good economist, you have to know more than just about economics. I hate to say that. You have even have to know about history, political science, sociology, psychology. You know, you know, all those things make you a better economist. Anthropology, all those things. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for your time.